Uh, hello guys, in this part I want to talk about the metabolism of uh, the skeletal muscle cell. Most of uh, the ATP which is required by the skeletal muscle fibers is used to reset the myosin head of the tick filament during each muscle contraction, which demands a large amount of ATP. ATP is also required by the calcium pump within the sarcoplasmic reticulum membrane to return the calcium ion to this sarcoplasmic reticulum for a storage, as I described it for you uh, before. And in the skeletal muscle, we have uh, a, only a little ATP storage. And additional small amount can be rapidly uh, produced as phosphate, as you see in this picture, transferred from one ADP and attached to the other ADP and make one ATP and one ATP. This reaction can be done the enzyme which we call it myokinase. So by the function of myokinase, two ADP can uh, make reaction with each other and the result is creation of one AMP and one ATP. You know that ATP is adenosine triphosphate. We have three phosphate groups in the ATP. In each ADP, we only have two phosphates. So one phosphate from one ATP can ADP can go to the other ADP, may ATP and AMP. This is one of the way which we can make um, ATP in the skeletal muscle cell. We have the other ways for making ATP. One of these ways is called is glycolysis, and the other one is aerobic cellular uh, respiration. First, I want to talk about the keratin phosphate. The keratin phosphate is a molecule between a high energy chemical bond between keratin and phosphate group, and it's present in tissue with both large and fluctuating energy needs, like our muscles and our brain. When a skeletal muscle is actively contracting, the P which is located in keratin phosphate can move and transfer to one ADP. Our ADP has two phosphate group, and now we add the other phosphate group to ADP. The result is one ATP and keratin without phosphate. This reaction is catalyzed by keratin kinase. And uh, this um, amount of ATP, which is produced in our skeletal muscle cell, can provide an additional 10 to 15 seconds of energy during maximum um, exertion. The other way is called glycolysis. Uh, the glycolysis is a metabolic pathway which involves uh, the breakdown of glucose into two pyruvate molecules. And in this pathway, we can produce two ATP. It occurs inside the cytosol. And you need to know that uh, it can uh, be done when we don't have any oxygen inside the cell. So this way is an epic. ATP production in our cells. In uh, one of the main advantage of production of ATP by this glycolysis is that it doesn't require oxygen and the other is the rapid rate of ATP production. Although a lower total amount of ATP is produced, but the ATP uh, can produce more quickly and um, it can um, solve uh, the requirement of ATP in our cell. Look at this picture. In this picture, you can see one glucose can break down, and uh, by this breakdown, we have creation of two pyruvic acid. In this reaction, two ATP and water is released, and this ATP can be produced very quickly without need of oxygen, and our cell can use this. ATP. What 
would happen to this pyruvic acid after its production? First, you need to know that if we have oxygen availability in our cell, this pyruvate molecule can go to mitochondria and then uh, it can use in the mitochondria, it's broken down um, and our mitochondria can use it again. And when we don't have any oxygen inside the cell, this pyruvic acid can change to uh, lactic acid. And lactic acid uh, can be used in our cells later, which I will talk about it for you um, later. So by the glycolysis, we can make two uh, pyruvic acid, and if we don't have any oxygen available, these pyruvic acids can change to lactic acid. During glycolysis, we can make two ATP from each glucose. And the other way for uh, making ATP is aerobic cellular respiration occurs within the mitochondria and it requires oxygen, which is made available from the blood or released from the myoglobin. The myoglobin is a protein in our uh, skeletal muscle cell which can attach to oxygen molecule and supply oxygen for our muscle cell. It involves different stages in, uh, for making um, the ATP inside the cell. One of the primary advantage of production of ATP by aerobic cellular respiration is the variety of nutrients which we can use, which include pyruvate, fatty acid, amino acid, and uh, the other product. The other advantage is this, the amount of ATP which is produced by aerobic cellular respiration is too much. For example, uh, we can make 30 uh, ATP by uh, this um, type of respiration. And also triglycerides can be used um, as a fuel to make ATP in our uh, cells. In this picture, you can see the different methods for making ATP inside the skeletal muscle cell. When our muscle cell is active, uh, we can um, use myokinase, ADP and ADP can attach together and they can make ATP and AMP without the need of any energy. The other, I'm um, sorry, without um, any oxygen. Uh, the other one is um, uh, the reaction which we have between ADP and carotene phosphate, which is catalyzed by carotene kinase, and the result is ATP and carotene. The other method for making ATP without um, the need of oxygen is glycolysis, and you see that the glucose can easily move from the bloodstream to our skeletal muscle cell, and uh, the glucose can broken down and it can make pyruvate, and this change can make two ATP for us. This pyruvate can uh, go to the mitochondria if we have oxygen inside the cell, and if we don't have any oxygen, it can change to lactic acid. And the other method for ATP production is aerobic um, respiration in the cell. In this aerobic respiration, we require uh, oxygen, a slower production of ATP than glycolysis, but greater amount of ATP is uh, produced. And we can use different fuel to make ATP. These are the different methods for making and creation of ATP inside the cell. Uh, I told you that uh, after uh, we have production of pyruvate uh, in the glycolysis, this pyruvate without oxygen can change to lactic acid. The lactate formation from pyruvate occur under condition of low oxygen availability. This occur during intense exercise when a skeletal muscle's oxygen demand for aerobic cellular respiration cannot be met. The pyruvate molecule are instead converted to lactate molecule and the enzyme which can do this reaction is called lactate dehydrogenase. Now, 
what happened to this lactate following its formation? Lactate can either enter the mitochondria within the skeletal muscle cell where it's converted back to pyruvate and then oxidase to carbon dioxide through aerobic cellular respiration. Or sometimes it leaves the skeletal muscle fiber and enters the blood. Lactate which enters the blood can be obtained by cardiac muscle cell in our heart and then it can be converted to pyruvate and oxidized through aerobic cellular respiration. Or it can be taken up by the liver uh, and then in the liver it can change to uh, the glucose through gluconeogenesis. So the lactate which come to our blood uh, can be up, taken up by cardiac muscle or our liver and these two organs can recycle lactate for us. And we have a cycle which we call it lactic acid cycle. And it means that we have cycling of lactate to liver where it's converted to glucose and transport of this glucose back to muscle to reserve it as the energy storage inside our cell. The other concept which you need to know about the skeletal muscle metabolism is oxygen depth. There are limitations to how much oxygen can be supplied to a skeletal muscle in a given time period. When an individual participates in exercise during which the demand for oxygen exceeds the availability of the oxygen, an oxygen depth is occurred. The oxygen depth is the amount of additional oxygen which is needed after exercise to restore peri-exercise condition. Additional oxygen is required for these things. First, we need to replace oxygen on hemoglobin and myoglobin. Uh, hemoglobin is located in the blood and myoglobin is located inside the muscle. It can make glycogen again for us. It can make ATP and carotene phosphate and it can convert lactic acid back to glucose. So we need oxygen for doing all of this process in our skeletal muscle and also in our uh, body. The skeletal uh, muscle fibers are organized into three primary categories. And I want to discuss these different categories for them. First, we can um, classify our skeletal muscle fibers based on type of contraction which they can generate and then the primary means which we can uh, supply their ATP. First, type of contraction generated. A skeletal muscle fibers differ in the power, a speed, and duration of the muscle contraction generated. Power is related to the diameter of a skeletal muscle fiber. Large muscle fiber have larger number of myofibrils in parallel, and they allow them to produce a more powerful contraction. A speed has traditionally been described based on whether the skeletal muscle fiber expresses the relatively slow or fast ATP uh, as, um, function, the enzyme which can split the ATP. Those with a fast ATP ACE function is called fast twitch fibers. Those with the slow ATP ACE function are called a slow twitch fibers. So the speed and uh, duration related to type of myosin ATP ACE. Also, it's related to quickness of action potential propagated, the quickness of calcium which is released and reuptake by sarcoplasmic reticulum. So fast twitch fibers can do all of this process very fast and slow twitch fibers can do all of this process very, very slowly. 
in uh, this slide, you can see the fast twitch and the slow twitch fiber. In fast twitch fibers, the uh, breakdown of ATP is very fast. We have fast rate of action potential, quick release and uptake of calcium ion, initiate a contraction more quickly, and contraction or sh uh, shorter, have shorter duration. But in a slow twitch fibers, the breakdown of ATP is very slow. We have a slow rate of action potential, a slow release and uptake of calcium ion, initiate a contraction very slowly, and the contraction happen in longer duration of time. So they can be relaxed slowly again. These are the differences between fast twitch and a slow twitch fibers. Based on the means of uh, supplying ATP, we can divide our skeletal muscle into two groups. One of the groups is called oxidative fibers. Oxidative fibers are fatigue resistance fibers. These oxidative fibers use aerobic cellular respiration. They use oxygen for doing their, um, for making their ATP. In these fibers, we have many, many capillaries and blood vessels. We have many mitochondria, and we have large supply of myoglobin. The color of myoglobin is red. The color of blood capillaries are red. So the oxidative fibers are classified as red fibers. The other group of muscle fibers are called glycolytic fibers. These fibers are fatigable fibers. They become tired very soon. They use anaerobic cellular respiration. They have fewer calories. They have fewer number of mitochondria, a small supply of myoglobin, and large glycogen uh, reservation. Because the amount of blood capillaries and the myoglobin is few in these fibers, these fi fibers uh, have white color, and we call them white fibers. Now, the physiologist use both the type of contraction generated and the primary means of supplying ATP to differentiate skeletal muscle fibers into three subtypes. One of them is called a slow oxidative fibers, which is type 1. One of them is fast fibers, which is type 2A, and we call them intermediate fibers. And the last one is called fast glycolytic fibers, which is type 2B, and they are very fast anaerobic fibers. About the first one, a slow oxidative fibers. The slow oxidative fibers typically ha have half of the diameter of skeletal muscle fibers and contain a slow myosin ATPase. These fibers can produce contraction that are slower and less powerful. However, they can contract over long period of time without fatigue because ATP is supplied uh, mainly through aerobic cellular respiration. These fibers appear dark red because of the presence of large amount of myoglobin and um, also mitochondria. So uh, they are uh, are high endurance since ATP supplied aerobically. The next group of fibers is fast oxidative fibers. The fast oxidative fibers or intermediate or type 2A uh, are intermediate in their size and contain fast myosin ATPase. They produce a fast, powerful contraction with ATP provided primarily through aerobic cellular respiration. However, the vascular supply to fast oxidative fiber is less extensive than the network of capillary, which we have in a slow oxidative fibers. 
Thus, the delivery rate of nutrient and oxygen is lower. These fibers contain myoglobin, but less than the amount which can find first group or a slow oxidative fibers. These fibers can be distinguished from a slow oxidative on a microscopic image because they appear lighter red when we compare them with the first group. And the last group is called fast glycolytic fibers. These fast glycolytic fibers, also called fast anaerobic fibers, or type 2B. They are the most uh, prevalent skeletal muscle fiber type. They can make contraction very fast and powerful. They are largest in the diameter. They contain fast myosin ATPase and provide both power and speed. However, they can contract for only short bursts because ATP, which is produced here, uh, happen by glycolysis. These fibers appear white because of the relative lack of myoglobin and uh, mitochondria. In this picture, uh, you can uh, see the cross section of a skeletal muscle. We use a specific staining technique to demonstrate the different types of fibers in this muscle. The fibers are distinguished by their shade of color. You can see a slow oxidative fibers, which are uh, the darkest one. We have fast oxidative fibers, which are um, not dark and they are not light. And we have fast glycolytic fibers, which are the lightest. And in one um, bundle or fascicle of the muscle, we can see uh, all of these fibers. But depends on the function of muscles in different parts of the body, the ratio of these muscle fibers are different. The muscle tension in a skeletal muscle. Muscle tension is the force which is generated when a skeletal muscle is stimulated to do contraction. The term tension is used to describe the force that a muscle exerts because a muscle can only pull on a structure. Your muscle go to contraction and by their contraction, they can move one part of your body. They can move one bone. Muscle tension produced in contracting muscle is measured in different ways in labs. One of the ways which we can uh, use for measuring this muscle tension is the myograph. Here you can see a myograph. You see that we can um, attach this muscle, which is the gastronomius of the frog, in this device. And then we can make the stimulation. Um, and after stimulation, you can see this muscle twitch. You can see this muscle contraction. And this graph, which is made here, is called myo. Gram. The myogram is a graphic recording of the changes which we have in muscle tension when we have a stimulation. Now I want to talk about uh, this uh, muscle twitch. The muscle twitch is a brief contraction to a single stimulation. The minimum voltage which can make this contraction and which can trigger this twitch is called threshold. And we have different periods for the muscle twitch. One of them is called latent period, one of them is called contraction period, and the other one is called relaxation period. I will talk about each of these periods in um, this picture. First, we have uh, the latent period. There is a delay, which we call it latent period, that occurs 
after the stimulation um, is applied and before the contraction start. You can see this latent period by the yellow color here. There is no change in muscle fiber length during the latent period. This delay can be accounted for the time which is necessary for all of the events in excitation contraction coupling calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and beginning of the tension in skeletal muscle fiber after this latent period and after everything um, which is required for contraction become available in our cytosol we have the next period or next phase which we call it contraction phase begins as a repetitive power stroke pull the thin filaments past the thick filaments and make the sarcomere become short and muscle tension increase during muscle contraction and after that, you can see the relaxation period or relaxation phase. This period begins with release of cross bridge as calcium ion is returned to its storage in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Muscle tension decreases during muscle relaxation. Relaxation depends upon the elasticity of connectin. Do you remember the connecting the proteins, which is very similar to springs, uh, and uh, they attach to the myosin? So uh, the muscle tension, uh, the muscle tissue, return to its original length following shortening of the muscle. So each muscle twitch, which is a single brief contraction, has three phase or three period latent contraction and relaxation when everything goes back again to its um, relaxation and normal uh, phase the next thing which um, i want to talk about is the two types of contraction we have uh, two types of contraction. One of them is called isometric contraction and the other one is called isotonic contraction. Two primary factors must be considered when we want to describe the muscle contraction. First, the force which is generated by the muscle and then the resistance that must be overcome. When a skeletal muscle tension is insufficient to overcome resistance, we don't have any movement of the muscle. This type of muscle contraction is called isometric contraction. The skeletal muscle contracts and muscle tension increase, but muscle length stays the same. We have some examples for isometric contraction, like when we push on a wall, holding a very heavy weight in the gym, uh, while uh, your arm doesn't move, attempting to move a shower load of a snow which is very heavy, or holding baby in one position. Your muscle contracts, but the length of your muscle doesn't change and we don't have any movement. The other type of contraction is called isotonic contraction. When skeletal muscle tension results in movement of muscles. This type of contraction is called isotonic contraction. The tone in the skeletal muscle remains same. The way of this baby doesn't change, but by contraction of this muscle, we can move the baby by our upper limbs. Example of isotonic contraction is like walking, lifting a baby, or swinging a tennis racket. Isotonic contraction are differentiated into two subclasses uh, based on whether the muscle becomes shorter or longer. The shortening of muscle length is called concentric contraction, and when the muscle length increases, we call it eccentric contraction. 
So the isotonic contraction happen when the skeletal muscle tension is greater than its resistance. Sometimes our muscle become shorter, concentric, or it become longer, which we call it eccentric. And in isotonic contraction, we have movement. So the isotonic contraction uh, occur when the muscle exert a constant force during the contraction and the length of the muscle change. If the muscle becomes shorter, we call it concentric. And if the muscle becomes longer, we call it eccentric. And isometric contraction occur when the muscle remains at a fixed length during contraction. The next thing uh, which I want to talk about is about muscle uh, fatigue. And I don't know why the slides appear uh, like this. The muscle fatigue is the reduced ability or inability of the skeletal muscle to make muscle tension. The primary cause of muscle fatigue during excessive uh, exercise is a decrease in glycogen storage in our muscle fibers. However, there are many causes which um, um, are listed like um, here. Um, I cannot see them here, but uh, uh, listen to me. One of them is um, uh, excitation at the neuromuscular junction. Muscle fatigue may be caused either by insufficient calcium ion at the neuromuscular junction to enter the synaptic knob or by decreased number of synaptic vesicle to release the neurotransmitter. Both limit the ability of somatic motor neuron to stimulate our muscles. The other one is excitation, contraction, coupling. Muscle fatigue may be due to a change in an ion concentration that interferes with the ability of muscle fiber to conduct an action potential along the sarcolemma. This interferes uh, with a stimulating release of calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And the other cause is cross-bridge cycling. Muscle fatigue may result from increased phosphate concentration inside the cell. When the amount of phosphate increase in the muscle sarco sarcoplasm, it um, interferes with the release uh, from the myosin head during cross-bridge cycling. And then it uh, can uh, slow the rate of cycling. Lack of ATP is not currently thought to be a primary cause of muscle fatigue. This is because ATP levels are generally maintained through aerobic cellular respiration, mitochondria during exercise. Effects of exercise. Changes in muscle from a sustained exercise program. When we have endurance exercise, it can lead to better ATP production. We can make more ATP. And when we have resistance exercise, it can make hypertrophy of the muscle. Muscle increase in their size due to increase in synthesis of contractile protein. Muscle can increase glycogen reservation and also the number of mitochondria. And also it appears to stimulate limited amount of hyperplasia. Hyperplasia means increase in the number of fibers, not increasing in the size of the cell. And changes in muscle from lack of exercise uh, is this, our muscle go to atrophy. Atrophy means that the size of the muscle decrease. For example, when you wear a cast, after you remove the cast, the size of the muscle um, decrease because you don't have any exercise and any movement of that muscle. And the age 
can affect uh, the muscle. Uh, we have loss of muscle mass by aging. A slow uh, loss begins in persons uh, in mid 30s uh, due to decrease in activity. We have decrease in the size, power, and endurance of muscle fibers. The number of fibers decrease and the diameter of fibers decrease. We have a decreased oxygen uh, storage capacity in the muscles and decreased circulatory supply to the muscle uh, with exercise. And uh, because by aging, the number of satellite cells which we have between the muscles decrease, we have a reduced capacity to recover from injury. And when we don't have enough satellite cell to uh, do regeneration, fibrosis take place. And instead of muscle cell formation, we have uh, dense regular connective tissue formation. And the connective tissue don't have that flexibility like muscles. So the function of the muscles and the flexibility of the muscles decrease by aging. The part uh, which I want to talk about is the uh, shape of the cardiac muscle fibers. The cardiac muscle fibers are short branching fibers. They contain one to two nuclei. They are estriated because they contain sarcomere. They have many, many mitochondria, so they use aerobic respiration. And we have a specific structure which can attach two neighboring cells together. And we call it in intercalated uh, disc. The intercalated disc have two parts. One of them is desmosome and the other one is gap junction. The desmosome can hold the muscle cells physically and tightly near each other and the gap junction help the muscle cells to send their um, electrical stimulations to each other. The contraction of cardiac muscle fibers uh, is called is uh, happen uh, by the autorhythmic pacemaker cells. Uh, inside the heart, we have uh, two nodes. One of them is called SA node, and one of them is called AV node. You will learn about them in 2060 completely, and they can make contraction of the cardiac muscles. Heart rate and contraction force influence uh, by the autonomic nervous system. The sympathetic fibers can increase the heart rate power of contraction and parasympathetic fibers can decrease the heart rate. Parasympathetic cannot make any change in the contraction of the heart. In this picture, you can see the cardiac muscle cells. Uh, they are short cells. As you see here, uh, they are branching. Uh, at both ends and between two muscle cells, we have intercalated disc. Inside each cell, we have one or two nuclei, and our cells can show estriation due to presence of sarcomere inside the cell. The smooth muscle cells uh, are located in uh, most parts of our internal organs. You can see it in cardiovascular center, in your respiratory center, in your digestive system, in the ut uh, ureters and urinary bladder, and also in the uterus in female reproductive system. And in this picture, you can see the different locations of the smooth muscle cells, which are located in um, uh, most parts of our internal uh, organs. The smooth muscle cells, as you see here, are fusiform in their shape. Uh, this cell contain one nuclei, a nucleus per each cell. We have many filaments inside the cell, and when these filaments pass over each other, they can make some dense bodies inside the cell. They don't contain uh, T tubules, and only they have the small indentation on the surface of the cell, as you see here, and we call them cavoli. The process of contraction is completely different from uh, the contraction which we have in our, um, skeletal muscle cells and you don't need to know how they can go to contraction. Just you need to know their shape. And 
Uh, during development, we may have regeneration in some of uh, our uh, muscle fibers, but not in all of them. Uh, first, the cardiac muscle and the skeletal muscle become amitotic. They cannot do mitotic division. So if you were born uh, with, for example, 100 um, cardiac muscle cells, you have this 100 in your whole life. We don't have any mitotic division for them. And also we have it for a skeletal muscle too. Between these cells, we have myoblast-like satellite cells, and they have a very limited regenerative capacity. If we have any trauma, any injury for our skeletal muscle cell, we may have a limited regeneration. But our cardiac muscle cell doesn't have the satellite cell, and we don't have any regeneration for them. The cardiac and the skeletal muscle can only become thicker and and longer. Their number doesn't change. But the smooth muscle cell have good uh, regenerative ability. Uh, there is a biological basis for a greater strength muscle in men than in women. The women's skeletal muscle make up about 36% of their body mass, but in men's skeletal muscle, it's about 42% of their body mass. Uh, and this is the end of a muscle chapter.